Welcome to Sound Bites, hosted by registered dietitian nutritionist Melissa Joy Dobbins. Let's delve into the science, the psychology, and the strategies behind good food and nutrition. Hello, and welcome back to the Sound Bites Podcast. Today's episode is about the intersection of food insecurity and food intolerance. My guest today is Kate Scarlatta. She's a dietitian with a master's in public health who has more than 30 years experience and an expertise in gastrointestinal disorders and food intolerance with a particular focus on the application of the low FODMAP diet for functional gut disorders. Welcome to the show, Kate. Thanks so much, Melissa, for having me. Of course. And I should say welcome back to the show because you were on the podcast way back in episode number 85 in 2018, talking about digestive peace of mind, P-E-A-C-E of mind. It still remains one of my most popular episodes. And on top of that, you're a dear friend of mine. So I'm just thrilled to have you back on the show. Thank you so much. Before we get into this topic, which I'm very intrigued about and the work that you are doing in this area, I would love for you to share with our listeners a little bit more about your background and the work you're doing, and of course, uh, include any disclosures that you may have. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, I've been a dietitian for quite some time now, and in the beginning of my career, I actually developed... um, my own health issue, I developed um, scar tissue from a previous surgery that required an intestinal resection. So I lost about six to eight feet of my small intestine, and that resulted in a lot of digestive symptoms, which really prompted my interest in digestive health and what was out there in the literature and how could I make a difference to help people like myself that were really struggling to identify the connection between what they were eating and the symptoms that were generated when they ate. Um, My area of expertise has really been primarily irritable bowel syndrome and small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. That's a condition in which bacteria overgrow in the small intestine. They don't belong there. And the symptoms really mimic irritable bowel syndrome, which is a chronic disorder that presents with abdominal pain and altered bowel habits. But I'm also interested in celiac disease and inflammatory bowel disease and really other disorders um, that impact GI symptoms. Um, Many of my patients experience food intolerance as part of their disorder. And, you know, my job really has been to work with them to help with good symptom management, but also to make sure that they have a good relationship with food and find joy in eating. Because, of course, if food causes pain, Um, it's real easy for that to disrupt your relationship with food. So that's been important. As far as disclosures, you know, I've worked closely with Fody Foods. This is a company out of Montreal that provides certified low FODMAP and gluten-free foods. And then I've done a number of consulting opportunities, speaking engagements with Activia, North America, Danone, as well as Char, Gluten-Free, Green Valley Creamery. And other um, low FODMAP food companies such as Belly Welly Bars and Dr. Uh, Rachel Paul's Foods and the like. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, and I know based on our previous conversation in episode number 85, you're really one of the foremost experts, uh, dietitians on the low FODMAP diet. And so I really enjoyed learning about that from you um, in that conversation. But I'm curious why you've become interested in food insecurity and does this or how does this relate to food intolerance? I became really interested in food insecurity with the onset of the pandemic when I could see that more and more people were unemployed and the need for getting food from food pantries and reliance on, um, you know, federal help and a number of things were happening. And I really thought about my patients that are experiencing food intolerance because most food pantries 
provide food items like canned beans and pasta and bread and a number of foods that contain gluten and a number of foods that contain these FODMAP carbohydrates. Mm. And I thought, what are they doing Mm -hmm. if they're going to a food pantry and only getting foods that potentially could make them feel sick? How are they able to thrive during a very challenging time um, in our country? So that was really my aha moment. And I wanted to see how I could make a difference in this space. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense with the lens that you're seeing food and nutrition through and then seeing that. And I know, I mean, the pandemic has had a huge impact on food insecurity. Let's talk first about what food insecurity is. I did a recent episode with Clancy Harrison, a dietitian, I know you know her, on food insecurity and food injustice. And we kind of talked about, you know, what is food insecurity? What is hunger? But for people who haven't heard that episode, let's set the stage with that. What is food insecurity? Is it the same as hunger? Is it different? And if so, how? Great question. So food insecurity is the state of being without access to sufficient quality and quantity of affordable and nutritious foods. Where hunger is actually the physical feeling of discomfort or weakness caused by the lack of foods. Mm. So you can have or be food insecure and not hungry. Mm -hmm. If you're sustaining yourself with rice and potato chips, you're feeling full. But are you well nourished? No. Mm -hmm. You know, I often think of my even my own times during college. I was food insecure. My parents, I'm one of nine kids. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky to be in college. They had no money for me for food. And I did sustain myself on a lot of rice and crackers and things of that nature. So, you know, many of us have been food insecure, but maybe we're not experiencing hunger at the same time. And certainly sometimes they can overlap. We can be hungry and go to bed hungry and be food insecure. Um, But there is a little discrepancy between those definitions. Thank you. Yeah, I... uh... I I mentioned this on the podcast before. I I was on food stamps when I was a young child. And then, yeah, I think a lot of college students are food insecure. You know, you're talking about sustaining yourself on rice and crackers. I mean, I ate apples, pretzels, and bagels. (laughs) That was about it. Carbs, carbs, and more carbs. Yeah. Now, you talk about food-related quality of life, and that sounds very interesting. So I'd like for you to explain that a little bit. Absolutely. So food-related quality of life is really the impact of your diet, your eating behaviors, and food-related anxiety and its effect on a person's quality of life. So if you think of people with food intolerance, they're worried about identifying and avoiding food triggers. They're uncertain about food ingredients. They're worried about food costs because specialized diets have even more costs to them Mm. or higher price. And so these factors can really affect their quality of life related to food, to their diet. And so we often use this metric using standardized tools to really assess how diet impacts quality of life. And in people with GI disorders, we have found that they tend to have a poor or, you know, lower uh, score on their quality of life metrics because diet really does impact their quality of life and all of the changes that they need to adapt to because they have a special diet. You know, just dining out on a gluten-free diet adds so many layers of stress and anxiety to people And it's very different if you can just go to your restaurant and eat and be done with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we talked about this um, in episode 85. I I seem to recall it was a pretty shocking, I don't know if it was a statistic or an observation that some people are so impacted by their digestive disorder that they would be willing to like, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but something like trade some years of their life in order to be rid of that. Correct. So they did an international survey on people living with irritable bowel syndrome and found that on average, they were willing to give up 15 years of their remaining life for a treatment that would offer symptom relief. Wow. I mean, that's just... It's a lot. Incredible. Yeah. You know, and you've 
alluded to this, but to, you know, really put a finer point on it, I mean, digestive disorders, they can be so debilitating, you know, just leaving the home and being able to nourish your body, but having all these symptoms that are just, you know, so debilitating, it's just really, um, can be really so overwhelming. Absolutely. And it's embarrassing. You know, there's a lot of stigma in both food insecurity and food intolerance. So, Mm -hmm. you know, people don't want to talk about their diarrhea, right, just as a general, you know, concept at a cocktail party. So um, there's a lot of silence in this, you know, people going to a food pantry feel stigmatized and embarrassed, and people with digestive concerns feel stigmatized and embarrassed. So the combination can be really a challenge. Imagine going to a food pantry for the first time and you're a little unnerved to be there, and then you have special dietary concerns that are related to a GI disorder. It just adds an extra layer of complexity Mm -hmm. and you know, that's something that I'm trying to push forward so that we're asking questions about special diets. Mm -hmm. Just think about like when we used to go to a restaurant, no one ever asked at the restaurant, do you have any allergies? Do you have any special dietary limitations? Now I'm so grateful when people ask that at, at a restaurant. Not that I need it personally anymore, but mm-hmm. for my patients that I serve, they're making it easier and raising awareness and just serving people better. And that's a move in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. We need to talk about it more. And it sounds like that's happening. You know, I presented a food waste webinar a few months ago where we focused on the connection between food waste and food insecurity. So I know that according to Feeding America, in 2019, the overall rate of food insecurity was the lowest it had been in 20 years, which it was still high. But the pandemic changed that. So could you talk a little bit more about food insecurity in the COVID era? Well, we definitely saw a little bump in food insecurity in 2020. And now the numbers are starting to retract just a little bit. Feeding America estimated that about 45 million Americans, um, including 15 million children, um, were experiencing food insecurity in 2020. And that's about a 4% rate. And that rate dropped to 12% of the U.S. population are estimated um, to impact uh, 12% of the population in 2021. So it seems like we're seeing a little bit of a leveling off, but we're still seeing a lot of people hungry in the United States. 12% of the population is a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And to your point too, a lot of children. How has the pandemic impacted the way food pantries are providing services? It's a great question. And what we did see um, in a lot of the individual pantry uh, providers shared with me was that Previously, there was a lot of mobile vans that would go to various neighborhoods where Mm. people perhaps couldn't get out, couldn't afford a bus ride or had limited ability to get to the pantry. They would actually go into various neighborhoods with these mobile delivery trucks, but they um, had to stop that because of social distancing, Mm -hmm. you know, limitations. The vans actually opened up and were almost a store in themselves. So the use of the vans in some of the various neighborhoods that kind of shut down some of those services in the pandemic times. Also, and it's changed a little bit now as we're kind of coming into a different stage in the pandemic post vaccinations. But Mm -hmm. in the beginning, what was happening, instead of letting guests come into the pantry and select what they want, almost like a grocery store, A lot of pantries went into a bag-and-go type of environment. So they would bag up food for everyone similarly. Mm -hmm. So the choice option was removed. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine, and I spoke with Clancy Harrison about this, you know, some individuals were pulling out things like canned beans and leaving them on the church steps at the pantry that she was working at. And their initial response was, what the heck are people doing this for? This is good food. But I said, well, 
if it doesn't make them feel well, they probably feel better leaving it there with the hopes that someone else might take it. Mm -hmm. Um, So you can't always make assumptions, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of the self-selection and a lot of the outreach to some of the various neighborhoods definitely changed during, you know, the height of the pandemic, I think we're starting to see some reemergence back to traditional models now that we have um, a vaccine available. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, I hadn't thought of that. But yeah, when you're doing sort of a cookie cutter approach and removing the choice option, if you have a food intolerance, that just really throws a wrench into things. My food pantry and my community is based in my church. So my children and I um, help out uh, when the farmer's market is open in the early spring through the summer into the fall. Uh, we pick up fresh produce donations from the farmer's market and bring it to our, our food pantry. And uh, when the pandemic hit, unfortunately, like 10 days into lockdown, I fell and broke my hand. And all I wanted to do was help our food pantry. And I couldn't couldn't even like, well, I can't really wash my hands every five minutes. I can't really carry and lift anything. It was very frustrating. Yes. But uh, yeah, so there's, yeah, the, a lot of factors clearly are involved with running these food pantries. And even like you said, getting it to those hard to reach areas. But I understand you recently launched an initiative called End Hunger Pain. So I would love to hear all about this campaign and what compelled you to start it and what, what you learned during this process. You know, this was, you know, one of those aha moments, I'm going to do this. And Mm -hmm. my family thought I was crazy. And I executed it in six weeks. They didn't think the idea was crazy. But I really was. uh, I worked hours and hours every day trying to understand the food insecurity space, where I needed to raise awareness and how to get sort of the best bang for my buck. And basically, I started the End Hunger Pain Initiative really to raise awareness of the intersection of food insecurity and food intolerance and how industry and food pantries and volunteers could work together in a better way to provide food for people that may need special diets. And so we did this um, with a number of sponsors, Fodi Foods, Char Gluten Free. They not only donated to food pantries, but they also donated a number of food items. And so I wanted to go down with a splash. So we rented an Airstream trailer Hmm. and we filled it with donations that fit either an allergy-friendly, gluten-free, or low FODMAP diet needs. And we hand-selected various food pantries that were willing to help identify people in their community that could benefit from these foods and to just really be a little bit more aware of the fact that not everyone can eat the foods that they're providing. It was an amazing trip. My husband took the time off. My son videotaped it. We had a lot of TV and news um, clips. And the Airstream was all about marketing. And it really drew in a crowd. So every time we arrived at a pantry, there was a crowd waiting for us (laughs) and news people. and, um, And it was really, it was really, really lovely. It was a six-day East Coast tour, and we ended the tour at Atrium Health in Charlotte, North Carolina. And that part of the trip was really to work with healthcare providers to see where they could fit in this story. You know, what can they do better Mm -hmm. with their patients so that they're meeting the needs whether they have dietary restrictions or simply food insecurity issues. And one of the things that was really interesting during the tour, and I know you want to talk a little more about this, but one of the things that struck me in our one of the conversations with one of the primary care doctors, and this was a very um, low income area, mm-hmm. she said, we have given them vouchers for the food the local farmer's market. But for this population, going to a farmer's market was like something that only rich people did. It's a foreign concept. (laughs) It was a foreign concept to them. 
and just the need to, you know, it's great to talk to industry and it's great to talk to health professionals and it's great to talk to food insecurity, uh, volunteers and workers and organizations that serve them. But, you know, the most important person in this whole story is those that are living with food insecurity and they need to be at this table so that we can help them in a way that works for them. And that's often missing. And that's something that really hit home for me. Absolutely. So, yeah, I'd love to hear some more stories from your tour. And I know you also had a social media campaign as part of this, you know, things that surprised you or maybe some of the types of food products that were donated that can help people with food intolerance. Yeah, absolutely. So we had, as I mentioned, our two big sponsors were Char Gluten Free for the tour and Fody Foods. But throughout the campaign, we had plenty of other donations in our big airstream. Barilla pasta, they supported us with gluten-free pasta. We mm. had Orgain nutritional drinks. Cabot gave us lactose-free cheese. Nestle Health Science provided certain um, formularies that they provide. So the nutritional drinks that mm. were you know, lactose-free or gluten-free or fit certain dietary parameters. We also had um, 88 Acres, which is a local Boston company, provide allergy-friendly bars. And then subsequent to the trip, um, when we identified some food pantries that were very willing to help people with gluten-free and low FODMAP needs, Frito-Lay and Quaker uh, made donations. Frito-Lay has recently certified their Sun Chips and Beer Snacks um, by Monash University as low FODMAP. Hmm. And then Quaker also was uh, certified uh, gluten-free and they also have some low FODMAP oats. So we've been continually uh, working off this campaign and continue to donate with great companies that are willing, you know, to provide foods to kind of keep the product lines up and the food distribution still happening. That's wonderful. It's just, it's great to hear food industry, food companies providing support like this. And I think, you know, oftentimes we forget that many of these companies have quite diverse food portfolios, food and beverage portfolios, I should say, that are helping meet the needs with these special products. Absolutely. We don't hear about that enough. So that that's really wonderful. We don't. And, you know, just want to interject because you mentioned food waste. You know, there's a lot um, being done in that area as well. Um, you know, a lot of these companies have food that may be near expiration dates. And so we're working closely um, with different companies and saying, you know, we can get this right out to the pantry and on someone's plate in the next week. Can you get it there? And so we're helping with food waste as well. We also worked closely. Um, one of the groups that we visited was Food Rescue, and they have a variety of different agencies throughout the U.S., and their job is all about reducing food waste. And they get food from Trader Joe's and a number of different farms, and they bring it to food pantries. Uh, huge infrastructure, um, wonderful group. And I met with a group of them in Connecticut. Um, so there's so much really great work doing that's going to be better for the planet and better for the people mm -hmm. um, behind the scenes. It's really, um, it's been great to witness. That's great to hear. And I know that there's a lot of challenges and barriers coordinating all of that stuff, but we see the importance of it. And, and it's great to hear examples like this where people are just figuring it out, making it happen. Absolutely. So for our listeners, whether they're health professionals or general consumers, if people want to help out, they want to donate food to their local pantry, are there any specific foods that you would recommend that would be suitable for people living with like uh, gluten intolerance or requiring a low FODMAP diet? Thank you for asking. Yes. And I'm actually working on a gluten-free and low FODMAP shelf stable um, handout that I'll be sharing through social media mm. and on my website as well to help people because there are a number of patients that want to donate to food pantries that understand what it's like to live with food intolerance. So some of the grains that I recommend, um, rice, polenta, um, oats, if you get certified gluten-free oats, such as Quaker would be a great option, quinoa, millet. So you can get some 
gluten-free staples that also work for the low FODMAP diet as well. Mm. Um, and then there's a number of gluten-free pasta like Barilla or a brown rice pasta or quinoa pastas that work both for gluten-free and low FODMAP needs. Low FODMAP um, products made by Fodi Foods are low FODMAP certified by Monash University, but also are all gluten-free certified as well. Hmm. And then Char Gluten-Free has a number of low FODMAP certified food items, and they have a listing on their website if you wanted to get something that would work for someone on a low FODMAP diet as well as gluten-free um, peanut butter, almond butters, uh, tuna are great um, shelf-stable items. And then for legumes, we like canned lentils and we love canned chickpeas because they're on the lower end of the FODMAP spectrum. Hmm. This means that they have lower amounts of those poorly digestible carbohydrates that tend to trigger gas and GI symptoms and are really can be problematic in someone with IBS. But the canned chickpeas and lentils have the lower amounts of those FODMAP carbohydrates, so are often the best tolerated. So those are, you know, a couple examples of some shelf-stable foods that work well and would be very much welcomed at any food pantry. Oh, thank you. That's very interesting. And maybe we can collect some of those links and, and resources and, and your handout when it's ready. And put those links in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com. It would be great if every food pantry had the list, not only for themselves, but to share with the customers as well. Absolutely. Yeah, I know when working with my food pantry, I've been trying to, and if anybody listening has a resource for me, please reach out. I've just been trying to find a simple one pager that tells people how to either freeze or dry or store their fresh produce before it goes bad. You know, I'm kind of thinking back to my state extension days um, in college, where, you know, you don't have to kind of Google every single item and figure it out. But you have like just a one pager, you know, like, you know, we, we got a bunch of bananas from our local grocery store. But like my food pantry folks didn't know and they didn't know to tell the clients that, hey, you know, if they're starting to get too ripe, you can peel them and freeze them, you know, something so simple like that. I love that idea. And I have an intern coming. So maybe uh, we can chat about that. And maybe that would be a great project. Yeah, you know, talking about food waste, you know, exactly. No, it's all all important. These are important topics for dietitians. We're working with our, you know, consumers and with patients. And, you know, we all need to work together to reduce food waste and, you know, help others. And just save food that's good. You know, it's I love having my frozen bananas at my ready for smoothies and banana breads. And mm -hmm. yeah, so I, I'm with you. Thank you. So what do you say to people? This is kind of a, a conversation that's been going around in certain dietitian circles. What do you say to people who suggest that only quote unquote healthy foods be donated to food pantries? So I'm not on board with that because I think it's important. It, it comes to me personally, my opinion on this is that it comes from um, being privileged to say that. I think if a mom wanted to give their child a special yogurt that had cookies in it, for instance, so that they could feel special on their birthday at lunch, I think the mom should be able to get that at the food pantry. So I think we have to be careful. Um, it's an individual's right to pick and choose what they put into their body. And I think crossing that line, um, we need to be careful. That being said, I think there needs to be a wide variety of food options. I love that a lot of food pantries are opting to get these beautiful farm share provisions for their uh, guests. So, hmm. but I don't think it's anyone's right to tell someone what they can or cannot eat. And I think there should be a variety of foods at food pantries. That's my opinion. Thank you. Yeah, I think choice is very important and it's very empowering to be able to have a choice. I love that. So we've talked about a few examples, um, what people can do, but I would love to hear sort of a call to action for our listeners. What are a few specific things people can do to help out? In this space, it's specific to the intersection of food insecurity and food intolerance, I think. Consider donating gluten-free and low FODMAP grains, 
or products that you find at the grocery store, simply just choosing canned chickpeas for your legume donation um, can go a far way. Consider donating your time to, um, you know, they're constantly looking for helpers Mm -hmm. to work at these um, various pantries. I know Food Rescue, for instance, has a wonderful app and you can just select when you want to pick up a donation. It could be once a month, once every two months or every week. So it's just on your timetable if there's a food rescue near you. And then, you know, money goes a long way. A lot of these food pantries have access to food banks and they can get a lot of food for their food pantry at a much reduced cost. Hmm. So consider making donations to a food pantry and they can get more bang for their buck using your dollars. And any specific advice for dietitians or healthcare professionals? That there's a big role for you out there. You know, we have such a broad range of expertise and their staff, for instance, at whether they're a food pantry themselves or organizations that serve the seniors or various populations that have a high need for using a food pantry, they're very interested in learning from us. And so donating your time I recently did a talk for the National Celiac Association. They do a lot of work finding gluten-free foods and getting them to people in need just to teach them about the low FODMAP diet so that they could then be a resource for the pantries. So, you know, you have this wealth of knowledge, share it. And this is an industry that is primarily volunteer run. And so they're very excited to learn from you and um, share your knowledge. Excellent. Yeah, I love the concept of donating time and and the money point to your point. I think sometimes we just get in the mindset of grabbing whatever extra pantry items we have at our house and, and sending those over to the food pantry. But I know my food pantry, there are so many people involved. And you know, when I donate my time, yeah, it might be one pickup a month. Um, there's so many other people involved, or they might say, you know, we don't need you to do a pickup, but could you come and help with the distribution on a certain day? So there's a lot of different things that you could do and just kind of fill in wherever that need is. So thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. So what's next for you and your End Hunger Pain campaign? So I continue to work with the industry partners, um, Fody Foods, for instance. Um, We recently just got on a call with the National Celiac Association as they've identified key food pantries that are in need of low FODMAP and gluten-free foods. So we're trying to get more of a consistent calendar distribution so that the food pantries are not running out of these low FODMAP and gluten-free products. Um, I've also established a low FODMAP um, section at a, a local food pantry in Massachusetts called Project Just Because. Hmm. I love this food pantry. There's no questions asked. You could walk in and be a millionaire. They're not going to question you. You come in, you get what you need. It's a very low stigmatized, mm-hmm. friendly um, operation. And I said, can we start a low FODMAP section? And here are some educational tools for your staff. And they cleared shelves and we filled them. And they continue to get food products from Char and Fody Foods to maintain that. Um, and they're, to my knowledge, the first food pantry that has a low FODMAP section. So I'm really proud about that. Hmm. But I'm also working on additional research with some research teams across the U.S. to really look at how can we help people not only with food insecurity, but low socioeconomic status to really help with their accessibility to foods, but also education. Are certain diets, for instance, just for the upper echelon? Um, We know the low FODMAP diet, for instance, needs to be provided or really should be provided with the guidance of a dietitian. Mm. Many people do not have coverage for a dietitian. So what does that mean? Mm -hmm. Do they just get dropped off and not it's not an option? 
And so I really want to explore that because I think we really need to be careful about how are we best helping everyone, not just people with means. Mm -hmm. Just a sideline that came out of this um, project, while I was working with the group in Charlotte, North Carolina at Atrium Health, it was brought to my um, knowledge that they were not educating certain patients on a low FODMAP diet due to low literacy. Hmm. And I said, well, hmm, let me create a visual handout for you as long as you can provide some guidance with my visual infographic. I think this might work. Hmm. So now they have a low literacy, low FODMAP handout. I would didn't experience the need for that in my practice, mm -hmm. but how wonderful that I could literally in an hour or less create a beautiful handout and have opened the door to someone to a therapeutic diet strategy that is effective in 70% of people with IBS, why should the fact that someone can't read be a limitation? And why are we not talking about this? Wow. So I think there's just so many layers to this. But the more you talk to people, um, which was, you know, one of the big takeaways from our experience on this road trip, was that you just saw the unique needs through different lenses and we learn from each other and that's what makes the world a better place. So I think, you know, you got to put yourself out there and you've got to stay curious and keep learning and figure out the best way to help people in need because that's what makes the world go round. Wow. Wow. That's major. Yeah. I mean, so many challenges, but a lot of opportunities and it sounds like the conversation is where it's at. And we need to continue this conversation for sure. Absolutely. And I appreciate being able to use your audience and, you know, your great presence out there to share it, because I do think a lot of people just like me haven't had that aha moment that there is a sub segment of people out there that have additional challenges with food insecurity. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you said, a lot of layers and I know when I talked with Clancy, you know, she's like, I still have aha moments every day, every week. So it's a learning journey for sure. Where can people find out more information about End Hunger Pain and find you and follow you online and on social? So I do have a link and I'll share it so you can provide it. It's on my website under my I Believe in Your Story campaign. I have two campaigns and it's sort of under that tab, but I will give you the link so you can share with your show notes. Mm -hmm. um, on Twitter, you can find me at, at Kate Scarlotta underscore RD and at Kate Scarlotta, which is K-A-T-E-S-C-A-R-L-A-T-A on Instagram. So at Kate Scarlotta on Instagram. And those are the two social media platforms that I'm most active on. Great. Yeah. And your website is katescarlotta.com. And if, yeah, if you go to the I Believe in Your Story tab, there's information there. Do you want to tell us briefly about I Believe in Your Story? I know we talked about it in episode 85, but for anybody who's curious... This was another campaign that I started for people living with irritable bowel syndrome, which is a highly stigmatized condition. And I wanted to provide an opportunity for them to share their story in a safe place. And in doing so, many people shared their inspirational stories. We kind of came together um, and continue to come together and I continue to share stories. So it was really an awareness campaign to support people living with this chronic debilitating condition. Um, we also, through this particular campaign, raised money to funnel to two different research centers, Mark Pimentel's MAST lab at Cedars-Sinai and Dr. William D. Che's research lab at UMichigan. He does a lot of work with irritable bowel syndrome and the low FODMAP diet research so those were the two um, donation sites. So we've raised, you know, thousands of dollars for both of these centers and continue to raise money through the I Believe in Your Story campaign. So that's been great. And for any of your listeners that are interested in learning more about just general information about the low FODMAP diet, 
I have a number of resources on my website, um, katescarlotta.com. There's a FODMAP tab Mm -hmm. and there's plenty of low FODMAP free resources. I do have a shop with additional educational tools for clinicians If there's clinicians listening that are educating patients on the low FODMAP diet, those are available as well. There was a lot of need for a lot of materials for the low FODMAP diet when I first came in on the scene with this diet back in 2011. Um, And so I've just continued to make um, a number of different resources for clinicians and patients alike that might benefit from this diet. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for all of this important work you are doing and for coming on the show and sharing this with us. I will have all of the links in my show notes at soundbitesrd.com, including your uh, episode 85 and the episode with Clancy, number 172. Stay in touch with us. I, I look forward to staying tuned to what you're doing and hopefully seeing you in person again someday soon. I know. I hope so. <laughs> thank you so much. All right. Thank you. And for everybody listening, as always, enjoy your food with health in mind. Till next time. For more information, visit soundbitesrd.com. Music by Dave Burke, produced by JAG in Detroit Podcasts. 